Oh, thank you, Lord, for these wonderful friends and these wonderful people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave yourself to us upon the cross and that you forever live within our hearts. If only we will open the door of the heart to you. You still have left us free will. We may either open it or we may close it. Thank you, Lord, that everyone here has opened the heart to you. Now, I thank you also that this is not the end of your gifts to us, but that you can, in addition, live within our spirits, illumining our spiritual beings with the light of your Holy Spirit. And for this also, O oh Lord, I rejoice and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Now, when I say us, I wonder who all I do mean. You can see I come from the South. I say who all and you all, which is perfectly grammatically correct. I wonder how far does that go? And what is our God's final intention? Now, I'm not telling you I know. I'm only telling you that I wonder. And I was reading this morning in, in the fifth chapter of Revelation of the marvelous vision that St. John had. And he saw around the throne the four and twenty beasts, aquilic and critters, sounds like something in science fiction when you read the description, which I won't right now, and the four and twenty elders. Now, was he just having a nightmare or what? How do you know what kind of living creatures abide on other planets, around other suns, in other galaxies, in this unbelievable universe? Because we think we're the prettiest and the best looking, but how do you know? <laughs> we may meet some queer birds when we get up there. <laughs> Won't that be fun? <laughs> or on the other hand, it may be all symbolic, but anyway, here's his vision. He saw the 24 around the throne, the four and 20 beasts and the four and 20 elders. And he said, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And their number was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, crying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive riches and honor and glory and might and power and blessing. And every creature that is upon the earth and every creature that is beneath the earth and all that is in the sea and all that is in them heard I crying, blessing and power and honor and glory and might to him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. I don't know what that means. I used to think it was very funny when we would sing the great long te Deum, you know, in church. <laughs> I used to think it was very funny indeed, especially when it got to, O ye whales, bless ye the Lord. <laughs> yeah, it just tickled me. I can imagine all the whales spouting and blessing the Lord. <laughs> My father-in-law, who was an Episcopal priest, carved on the wooden mantelpiece above his fireplace, O ye fire and heat, praise ye the Lord. <laughs> Or is it blessed you, the Lord? Well, anyway, I don't suppose we will know the fullness of this meaning until we get to heaven, and even then it may take us a few millenniums to uh, become acquainted with all of it, which is very exciting, I think. If you knew everything the minute you got to heaven, what would you have to do from then on? <laughs> <laughs> But even here on this earth, we find out more and more <clears throat> of the glory of God. Now, I cannot remember the time when I did not believe in Jesus Christ and know that he died for me. I was born of Southern Presbyterian missionary parents every single day as far back as I remember. We had family prayers which consisted of one hour of Bible study and prayer. Praise the Lord, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. Of course, we were in China. I had this one great blessing. I never went to school. <laughs> I was spared that. That's true. I went to college. I was privately tutored by my mother at home who prepared me for college. 
And I loved college and had no difficulty whatsoever with any subject. A little difficulty with math, but I got through, you know, trigonometry. Well, anyhow. <laughs> so as long, you know, so in a way, I sort of envy some people that can tell of a glorious e conversion experience. How, how can I? I can't. I'm sure when I was three years old, I knew Jesus. Very likely when I was two years old. I can't remember the time when I didn't. And yet, in a way, you may miss a little excitement of a change, you know. But yet, in another way, there's something rather lovely about that. But now, here is a queer thing. Even though I believed in the blood of the Lamb and the sacrificial death of Jesus, and I knew Jesus, and I loved Jesus from my earliest memory, still... There was something I didn't know. I'll tell you how I came to know it. Some of you have heard this story before, but it's the best way I know to get it across, so excuse me if you've heard it before. Um, I was traveling on the train one time, and I was going to Tucson to visit Marion Lovkin and a couple of other friends there. And she had decided that we would not have public lectures this time. I'd been doing it for a couple of months, you know, and would just have a rest. While traveling on the train, I was simply exhausted, you know. And there's no use saying, oh, God does it all, I don't do anything. You do do something. You can't do it without God. In many cases, God can't or he won't do it without you. So he has ordained that we are the ones to convey and conduct his love to other people. And one way is, in the, like the beautiful incidents, that Reg has told us to dare to say to somebody, I love you, but <laughs> I did that one time in a moment of exuberance. Um, I was buying a fur coat in a little Jewish store. <laughs> and when the Jewish man delivered it, it seemed that he had certain rather frisky ideas. <laughs> Which was not what I meant at all. <laughs> <laughs> on some occasions a more convenient way is to show somebody you love them just by through this little thing of healing a couple of months ago I had, a, had to have a new roof so I summoned the roofer and the roof was put on you know and when he came in to give me his estimate on it he said well I'm very glad we just did get through with this because I have a kidney stone and I really have to have an operation on it next week. And so I said, well, look, <laughs> that's all right if you have to, but I know another way you might get rid of it just without having to have an operation. Oh, what's that? Well, I said, sometimes, you know, I pray for people and the Lord just takes care of it. Would you like that? Oh, yes, he was delighted. Edith was not at home. When I told Edith afterwards about how I made the roofer lie down on the sofa while I put my hands on his middle and prayed for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she said. But that was all right. That was perfectly all right. Well, every now and then Edith would kid me and say, well, I haven't seen any sign of that roofer yet coming back without his kidney stone. <laughs> but just before I came here, he rang the doorbell, and there he was. And the kidney stone had come out all by it itself, and he had not had to have an operation, and he was feeling very happy. And he had made for me a little teensy-weensy garden about this big, you know, in a beautiful little square pot. One of these, what do you call it, banzai trees. One of these little trees, you cut the roots and make them grow funny ways. And there was moss on the garden, and there was a beautiful rock there. I don't think it was the same one that came out. <laughs> been symbolic. <laughs> well, that was his very sweet way of showing me a bit of gratitude. But you see, the real thing is, that was a way, a practical way of showing him the love of God. And sometimes one way works better, and sometimes another way works better. Well, anyway, that way that I've just described, prayer with the laying on of hands, does require some energy coming out of us. And there's no good saying now, 
you know, I won't do it that way because I don't think anything happens unless you're willing to, for God to use your spiritual energy in any way he wants to. So therefore, to get back to my little story, I was terribly tired, and so I said to myself, now on this train trip, I'm not going to make any effort, I'm not going to smile, I'm not going to be happy, I, I'm not, for once, I'm just not going to try to make anybody else happy either, I'm not going to put on any lipstick, I'm just going to have me a nervous breakdown all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So I was just relaxing, and a lady said to me, you look very tired. And I said, yes, I am very tired. And she said, I know a book that will help you very much. It's called The Healing Light. <laughs> now, you know, actually, that's not as funny as it sounds. Because I was doing everything in that book. That's my first book, but it's not my last book. Don't come up to me and say, I have read your book. <laughs> Actually, when I wrote The Healing Light, I did not yet know the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. If you look at it carefully, you'll see. I hadn't come to that yet. Well, so anyway, I arrived at Marion's house, and I found that... Marion and Mildred were in the same state I was in. They also had been giving God's love here and there and pouring out energy through themselves, and all three of us were perfectly exhausted. And being exhausted, various little things were wrong with the body. I can't remember what, but you know, the sort of, sort of, <laughs> leaking out like a, an old dog. So we prayed for healing, and we did not receive healing. We prayed in every way we knew. Two of us laying hands on one and so on, gave it the works, nothing happened. We prayed for strength, we did not receive strength. Now, when you pray the prayer of faith, if nothing happens, then the next thing for you to do is to stop praying the prayer of faith and pray for guidance, you see. So that's what we finally got around to. We said, all right, Lord, what do you want us to pray for? And all three of us heard the same words inside of ourselves at the same time. And the words said, pray for the Holy Ghost. Now, we never use the words the Holy Ghost. It seems more refined to speak of the Holy Spirit. And we, why we thought we had the Holy Spirit? If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, who did? We were Episcopalians, every one of us. <laughs> <laughs> we were baptized and confirmed, and we've been doing the work of the Lord. Nevertheless, the voice inside of us had said, he didn't say it again, once was enough, pray for the Holy Ghost. So we said, okay, Lord, we don't know what you mean by this, but whatever it is, uh, we'll do it. And we decided that that evening, which was the quietest time, we would go into Marion's prayer room and pray for the Holy Ghost. Well, now, that day... God sent an angel to enlighten us. He did not look like an angel. He looked like a medical doctor, because he was a medical doctor. But he was one much interested in spiritual things. I really do not know whether he was a proper churchman or, or not. I, I don't know about that. But I do know his great interest. And so he told us the reason for his great interest. Now, he was a specialist in the inside of the head, you know, cranial surgeon or something or other. And what he said sounded very queer. I put it in one of my books, but my son, Jack, made me take it out because he said it would be too confusing for ministers. But, <laughs> but there are not too many ministers here, so I'll try. <laughs> No, really, what he meant was that, you know, is it sound theologically? I haven't the slightest idea. And furthermore, I don't know whether it's true or not. But I'm going to tell you, because this was what gave us a feeling of expectancy. You see, we had never met anybody who had had the experience of receiving the Holy Ghost in the rather exciting way that some of you know. And this aroused our expectancy. Why, this doctor said that he discovered in the inside of the head 
that the two main glands, the pineal and the pituitary glands, which, he said, should be rounded like that, like a little balloon, you know, were flattened as though they, like a balloon that had lost half of its air or three-fourths of its air. Moreover, he said, he discovered between these two glands the shrunken remains of a canal or channel which he felt was meant to connect the two glands. Now he said, I have a feeling, and he'd never heard of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm sure he was not much of a really informed Christian man, but he was a seeker after truth. I can't remember his name, never seen him again. Wish I would see him again. He said, I have a feeling that it ought to be possible for a human being to receive such a voltage of spiritual power that those glands would come back to their normal shape and size and that the canal between them would be opened and repaired by a miraculous spiritual power. That's what he said. Well, so we went in Marion's prayer room at light and we had the feeling of expectancy that his words had given us. But our prayers were very simple. We just said, Lord, we don't know what you mean by this. Pray for the Holy Ghost. But whatever it is, you've got to do it. Because if you want us to do your work, you've got to give us the strength to do your work. So we're going to stay right in here until you do it, whatever it is. Now, we didn't get that prayer out of the Episcopal prayer book. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, I think in our total ignorance that the prayer was absolutely right. We were not praying for a sign. We were not praying for a gift. We were not even praying for heavenly joy. All we were praying for was the one thing that Jesus specifically promised. Just before he arose and ascended into the heavens, he said to his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait, and he said, ye shall be endued with power not many days hence. We didn't even remember that. We just spoke in our childlike innocence, ignorance. But I think our prayer was exactly right. And so we prayed, two laying hands on one, two laying hands on one, because that's the way we were used to praying. And the same thing has happened to all of us. Now, if you'd been there, you would not have seen anything and you would not have heard anything. We did not speak with tongues. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad we didn't. Oh, of course, later on. Oh, sure, I've had the gift for 25 years or so. But I'm so glad it didn't happen at that time because it might have distracted my attention from the determination to receive the power. I might have thought, oh, this is it. I've got it all, you see. So I'm just thankful. There was no nothing. <clears throat> so what were the, the same things happened to all three of us. They were kind of queer in a way. One thing was that all three of us felt within the head an intense burning. It was like a live coal of fire in there. I mean, it burned. I mean, it really burned. Now, maybe if somebody else had been there, they might have seen something like, you know, on the first day of Pentecost, they saw cloven tongues as a fire. Well, whether you'd have seen it or not, I don't know. But it surely came. In fact, all that night, it really was uncomfortable. It really burned a bit too much. Oh, I don't mean it was agony, but I mean it was enough so uh, you couldn't go to sleep very well. But we didn't want to go to sleep anyway because, oh, the mind was so terrifically alert that we didn't have time to go to sleep anyway that night. And we didn't feel tired either. We felt marvelously refreshed in the morning. That burning did not die away for about <clears throat> two weeks. I mean, it gradually decreased and gradually decreased. Now, I can't prove it, and I don't know, but it may possibly be that what that doctor said took place. It may possibly be that there was such an inflow of God's Holy Spirit that even some physical channel for the coming in of his power was alerted, though uh, I don't know. But at any rate, all of us felt that. And you know, <clears throat> to this day... That's the surest sign to me. I very seldom feel it now, but once in a while, it comes again, just a little bit, not a whole lot like that, just a little. 
But to me, that's the surest sign of the Holy Spirit really being intensely active in there. Because, you know, when you once receive the gift of tongues, you can speak with tongues at will. But you cannot bring on this inner burning. There's no way. No way. So if you feel that, don't think you're getting a brain tumor. I said that because it went on so long, we really did get kind of scared. <laughs> and it felt like something was changing inside the head. And I remember we really did think, now what is happening? Okay, I'm just telling you, if you feel that, it's all right, you're not getting a brain tumor. Just rejoice in the Lord and, and rejoice. So we all had that. And then all three of us received instantaneously the three special gifts that Jesus himself mentioned in his last talk to his disciples. A talk about the Holy Spirit, and you'll find them in St. John 14 and 15. He did not list them, one, two, three, like that. But you look, you'll see them there. Now, the first one that we noticed was the gift of joy. And he said, and all that he said in those two chapters was based on this, <clears throat> that they should rejoice that he was going away for a while in his physical body because <clears throat> due to the fact that he was going away, therefore <clears throat> the Father would be able to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. You see, you understand, don't you? There was no way God could send the Holy Spirit to everybody before. We had gotten so far away from God. Adam and Eve in the beginning could see God as clearly as they could see man, you know, almost, and walked and talked with him. But we had gotten so far away. There was no way that he could do it unless Jesus made himself part of us on the cross, took our sins into himself, forgave them within himself, and shared with us the very energy of his blood. That's the only way it could have happened. You see. But since he did make himself a part of us, therefore the Holy Spirit could come. So he told the disciples beforehand these, main, these three main gifts. And the first one was the gift of joy. St. John 15, I or 16, it's somewhere in there. He said, my joy I give unto you that your joy may be full. Now this was not just a momentary excitement. And let me tell you, I do not think there is any good in just trying to work up a momentary excitement, you know. This kind of joy is deep and full and quiet and it flows like a river. And you don't have to try to jump around and, you know, carry on and get yourself excited. In fact, that distracts God's attention, I think, for, for, or distracts your attention anyway. No, this just comes. This just comes. Now, I've told many of you, you know, that when I first uh, found when I, the first steps in the healing life, that I was healed of mental depression by this prayer of a minister. That's the easiest thing that I know to heal. The only difficulty is to know when to pray it. Let me say this to you, prayers. You'll have to ask the Lord to show you. There are times when it's better to pray for the healing of the memories, and there is this difference. With all of you, I should think the healing of the memories would be the more appropriate. In fact, I'm quite sure of it because none of you are on the verge of insanity, and a person in real mental depression is on the verge of insanity. Leave it alone, and they'll come out of the depressive stage and whoops, into the manic stage. That's what happens. So therefore, you see, <clears throat> an ordinary sane person, you can pray for the healing of the memories, as Ross did so beautifully yesterday. And one person can pray for them, you see, and well, ask the questions that are necessary to find out what to pray for. But if a person is in real mental depression, don't do that. They couldn't stand the strain. Don't do it. Don't ask them any questions whatsoever. Four different ministers have told me the same story, that a man came to their office, a stranger to them, in deep mental depression, 
All four of these ministers used the wrong method. Either they tried to ask them questions, or they had learned this in psychology. They tried just silence. You know, just, just sit there a while in the big easy chair and relax, you know. All four of these men killed themselves on the way home. I'm telling you the truth. Three shot themselves, one jumped in the river. Now that was the fault of that minister and no question about it. He had them in his hollow of his hands. They came to him on the verge of cracking in deep depression. What he could do was so simple, so simple. Any one of you can do it. Any one of you can do it, I tell you right now. So don't worry about my words, just know. What do you do then? Why, you just lay your hands on the person's head and you just pray for Jesus Christ to come into the person and give them his joy. Now that doesn't mean a bouncy, excited joy, but his comfort, his love. All we've heard about giving the love of Jesus, this is the supreme time when that and only that will heal them, and that will heal them. Sure, fire, there's no question about it. I've never lost one in all the years. Never lost one. And when I say lost, the next step is either insanity or suicide. So you know very well whether you lose them or whether you don't. So what do you pray for? You don't know what their problems are. You don't need to. They couldn't tell you. Too much strain on them to try to tell you. Later on, sure, yeah, later on. But not now. So what do you pray for? It's so easy. You just pray for the love of Jesus to come in and fill them with his comfort and his peace and his joy and give them his light and bring to life the little spark of light that's in them. Call it the spirit or whatever you want to do. You see, the thing is, there are two sets of problems. I mean, if a person is mentally depressive, there is one set of problems. Later on, this minister told me what I should do, you know. He said, you're trying to make yourself a square peg in a round hole. He said, you cannot be it, you've got to be yourself. He talked to me a little, found out what I like to do. He said, now this is what you've got to do. You cannot spend all day washing diapers and cooking and knitting the children's sweaters. I, was, I tried to do everything, you see. I thought, here I'm stuck in New England with a New England minister and I am going to be the perfect New England housewife. Well, you see, God didn't want me to do that. <laughs> it's not my nature. He didn't make me after that pattern. So I was determined to remake myself into a pattern that was not mine. So the minister told me, he said, now this is what you must do. Every morning you must go over to the parish house for two hours by yourself, take a pencil and paper and write. Oh, I said, I can't, I can't. You know, three little children, this and that. He said, well, you'll have to get a babysitter and you'll have to do it. Those are my orders. Praise God, I had that kind of a minister. Ooh, some people might do better with the other kind that said, that say, you know, now let us talk about this together. <laughs> this minister didn't. He said, these are my orders. You do it. <laughs> Praise God. That's what I needed. Hmm. So I said, oh, I can, can't afford a babysitter. It's expensive. He said, it's not as expensive as a funeral. <laughs> So I did it. Well, so anyway, but that came later. I was healed instantaneously before he gave me any advice whatsoever. And that's because there's the other problem. No matter what are the surface problems on the outside, they can be coped with later. There's another problem, and that is that the light of the spirit in the person has gone out. Now, it can't really die, because the spirit cannot really die. But the light of it's gone out. It's as if you had a gas stove, and you know the pilot light there? Well, the fixture is there. That's built in. That doesn't go away. But sometimes the pilot light goes out. And when the pilot light goes out, you can't use any of the burners. So it's so simple. All you have to pray for is for the pilot light to come on. That's all you have to pray for. You don't have to know any of the ins and outs of it. Just pray for Jesus to come in 
and fill that person with his light and his love and his joy and then give thanks that he is doing so because, look, he's got to do so. I mean, there is nothing that could stop him. If what he said is true, if he loves us, if he cares for us, if all his promises about giving us his peace and so on, if they're true, there is nothing, no power in heaven or earth that can prevent that prayer being answered unless Jesus is a liar. So don't be afraid to try it. Now, of course, I don't guarantee that you might not once in a while make a mistake in the diagnosis, but so what? You can mend that afterwards. That's a small matter. So at any rate, that's the way the minister prayed for me. And I was healed instantaneously. Couldn't have taken more than three minutes at the outside. I think I was healed as soon as he said amen. I had forgotten what it felt like to feel like myself. My old self came back. On the way over there, I cried the whole way, which was good because I'd been frozen up and couldn't cry for about eight years. But on the way home, I shouted and sang. Fortunately, I was alone driving myself. I shouted and sang at the top of my lungs the whole way home. And it lasted. It was permanent. There was never any swing back. Oh, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's a bit lower, but I mean, just a normal variation but never any swing back to mental depression. So I was healed of the mental depression, <clears throat> but on this occasion, but however, what got me down and my two friends on this occasion, it was not mental, de mental depression. We were not mentally depressed. We, it was just pure exhaustion, that's so. all. We were exhausted because we were trying so hard to do all the work of the Lord without having the full power. We overstrained the amount of power we had because we didn't have the power of the Holy Ghost. We had the power of Jesus, but we didn't have the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus comes to us in two kinds. That's why we have two kinds at the communion service. He comes to us from the level of the earth, the blood of the Lamb, and maybe that is what enters mystically into the wine. But he also comes to us from the high heavens the bread of life. Two currents, two currents. And I, we didn't have the second current. So you see, the gift of joy was instantaneously and permanently given to all three of us. In all the years since, life on the outside has not been easier. Life on the outside can thicken up. Now you know that, that's perfectly natural. We have an enemy after all. We don't pay much attention to him, but you know. <laughs> But in spite of that, that joy has never wavered. Even in the darkest hour, it's always there underneath. It's like Jesus said to the woman at the well, you know, St. John 4. He said, Whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. For the water that I shall give him shall spring up within him, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. That was established at that time, and it has not failed since. Sometimes bubbling up more rapidly and happily, I mean, more in a livelier fashion, sometimes more slowly and gently. Now, up until this time, all my life long, there'd been this kind of, as long as I can remember. I guess I started this way back in China. Um, <coughs> There had been sort of a heavy feeling, almost like a lump in the middle. I hope you don't know what I mean, but I expect some of you do. And you know, I'd wake up in the morning and i think, oh, well, okay, another day. I've got through a lot of them. I'll get through this one, you see, and get up and sort of pull myself together to carry this lump of heaviness and do my work in spite of it. Do you know that from that instant when two friends, and they hadn't received the Holy Spirit either. I mean, all three of us were searching together. That lump disappeared entirely. I couldn't feel that way now if I wanted to. It's just gone. You know, cast your burdens before the cross, but how can you? I still don't know how you can. Maybe I should. 
But I know this way you can. When the Holy Spirit comes in, then the Lord himself takes the burdens out, and that's just, oh, that's just all there is to it. Now, another gift that Jesus promised was, he said, when the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, shall come, whom the Father will send in my name. Get that? In my personality. In the Bible, the name means personality. Through the divine personality of Jesus comes the Holy Spirit. He shall reveal to you all truth. He will lead you into a further understanding of truth. He will talk to you. He will instruct you. And I'm going to tell you something rather sad. I was brought up in a church where people were very consecrated. They were fully Christ-centered and fully Bible-centered. But they believed that when the last word of the book of the Revelation was written, the Holy Spirit shut up and hasn't spoken since. I mean, they really did. Can you imagine such a thing? But bless their dear hearts, they really did. I guess they misinterpreted St. John's remarks at the end of that rather fantastic book. Some parts I love, some parts I can't stand, quite frankly. But however, however, he was an old man then. He'd been in exile on this island a long time, and he was kind of cantankerous, and he didn't want anybody messing with it. And he said, he's, I'm just going to put a curse right now on anybody that takes any word out of this book. He meant the book of Revelation. The book of the Bible hadn't yet been written. The Bible had not yet been put together. He didn't mean the Bible. He meant what he'd just written, the book of Revelation. He knew it was kind of nutty in spots, I guess. <laughs> or it seemed so. So he said, now, don't anybody mess with this book. Don't take any word out. Don't add any word to it. As a writer, bless his heart, he had a perfect right to say that. <laughs> Sometimes I say it myself. <laughs> oh, I listen to my editors, you see. And some of the advice I accept, and some I refuse. And I say, and I did my last book, I said, no, I'm not going to make these changes. I said, take it as it is. I made the changes I approved of, you understand, but some others they wanted me to make. I said, no, take it as it is. You're not to take a word out. You're not to add a word in. OK, St. John, as a writer, had a perfect right to say that. But this dear church that I was in, you see, interpreted it to mean that the Holy Spirit of God could not speak again. How sad. So, that first night, the Holy Spirit was so busy talking to us, another reason we couldn't go to sleep, and revealing to us truth in very practical, simple ways. There were problems, little problems, you know, in our lives. Now, what shall I do about this? And how shall I manage that? And should I accept this invitation, or should I go there? And that very first night, the Spirit just told us exactly what to do. The, the guidance just flowed clearly and without any effort. Just flowed clearly, and all of you know about that. The Holy Spirit speaks to all of you. All of you know that now you can receive the guidance of the Lord. So that was the next gift that was given to us. And then the other gift that Jesus mentioned was the gift of peace. That's St. John 14. 1427, I think it is. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. You know, the world's idea of peace is just sort of, you know, goofing off. <laughs> you know, well, that's not the peace of Jesus, I can tell you that now. <laughs> not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The peace of Jesus is the center of quiet inside in the midst of strenuous effort. Still, that place of quiet inside. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. The world doesn't even understand Christian peace. Sometimes, you know, we talk about it and people that don't know, they kind of laugh at us, you know, and think, oh, well, you know. But they don't understand. <laughs> it doesn't even mean, as far as I know, Relaxation. <laughs> it sometimes means the most intense effort, and yet it's inside. Now, that was an instantaneous gift to all three of us. But I'm going to tell you the way I know it, which I think is the way I came to recognize it, which I think is very, very funny. 
I noticed that I could cook a dinner, and I don't cook dinner by opening cans and packages. Someday, if you really want me to, I'll give you my lecture on food. No, I won't, because nobody ever believes me. But <laughs> nevertheless, by my own experiments, I have come to the conclusion that there is more nourishment and more real life and vitality in fresh fruits than canned or frozen. And, and look, if you'd been canned or frozen a few months, you'd lack a certain vital quality you now have. <laughs> anyway, don't worry about that. Maybe that's just my own notion. And maybe it's the Lord's way of keeping me from getting too far off of earthly things. But anyway, what I serve on the table, I cook. I don't open a can. So, uh, but I discovered that I could cook a dinner for six people in a half an hour instead of an hour and a half. Now, that doesn't include dessert. We'd have fruit, you know, for dessert or something. And how come I didn't do anything different? So far as I knew in my conscious mind, I didn't think anything different. Nevertheless, it happened. I was at my son Jack's house one time, and uh, my other children, see, Jack and Lenny were there, and Tukey and Miles were there. Seems to be like Ted and Andy. Well, there were six of us anyway, as I recall. And um, when we sat down at the t and I said to the girls, I said, no, no I'm going to get dinner tonight. You girls have been, I was visiting them. This was before I lived there. I said, now you girls have been cooking for me. I'm going to get dinner tonight. So I sent Jack to the store. And I remember he came back at 6 o'clock with his cut-up chicken, you know, in a paper, sort of drippy, in his hands. And I forget what else we had, you see. And I said, now girls, get out of the kitchen because I cannot do this if you're in here under my feet. And that is true. The peace of God does not hold if people are around messing with me. Uh -huh. so <laughs> So I let Liddy set the table, <laughs> and I cooked it, and I got it all on the table, and it was a very good meal, too. And Liddy said, Mom, look at the clock. And I looked at the clock. It says 6.30. She said, I've heard you say you could cook dinner for six people in a half an hour, and I've been timing you. I said, oh, I'm glad I didn't know it, because I might have gotten rattled and not done it, you know. Half an hour instead of an hour and a half. Now, maybe you think I'm making a great matter out of something very small. No, I don't think so. I think this is very exciting and thrilling and very important. And the same thing took place with my writing, with my lecturing, with everything I did. I could do it about a third of the time with about a half of the energy. The only thing it doesn't apply to anymore is weeding the canyon. I tried that <laughs> very recently and found that perhaps I passed that stage. Well, anyhow. <laughs> the thing is, he doesn't want you to do, why, he won't give you the strength to do. <clears throat> but now look, I think what happened was this. I think <clears throat> that the power of the Holy Spirit entering in quickened my spirit. You know, you have a spirit, I've told you. And I don't think of it as a little blob of light I used to. But now I think more. Uh, I think of it more as a whole spiritual body like this one. But never mind. Think of it any way you want to. Make any kind of mental picture of it that you want to. <clears throat> In psychology, it would be called the supermind, I guess. Or Jung calls it the self with a capital S, meaning your bigger self, your better self. But however you think of it, you have a spirit. I might perhaps say more accurately, you are a spirit living temporarily in a body of flesh. But so the light of the Holy Spirit quickens your spirit, puts more life into your spirit, also quickens your conscious mind. There's no question about that. You can think more clearly. You, you get smarter. You can do things you never dreamed you could do before. Did you know I become a professional painter? I sell my paintings. Ha <laughs> ha. That's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I agree fully with all those nine or ten listed by St. Paul, but I just happen to know there are a lot more. Because I think the Holy Spirit quickens, adds energy, adds intelligence, adds life to whatever you do. 
If you're a school teacher, the Holy Spirit will quicken your school teaching. There's a gift of school teaching the Holy Spirit can give you, and this I know for a certainty because of my friends, whatever it is. So the Holy Spirit quickened the spirit, also the conscious mind, also the subconscious mind. Making more sure, making more real the answer to all of the prayers for forgiveness and cleansing that I had made. They'd been answered before, but there was more light, more light. And in so doing, don't you see, the Holy Spirit harmonized, brought together in harmony the spirit and the mind and the, and the subconscious mind. So that, of course, energy and ease was added to whatever one did. This, in addition to the purely spiritual revelations, energy and ease was added to whatever we did. You know, most of us, even Christian people, are like automobiles that are meant to run on six cylinders, and we run on four. Two dead cylinders. Because the spirit is not really quite alive. All right. This gift of the Holy Spirit being received quickens the other cylinders and brings to life the other possibilities. Now, I know that many of you know about this, and but I'm telling you this story, not that we shall right now undertake a prayer for it. You can't do it that quickly. I don't think so. I, I wouldn't anyway. I'd never try. Never, 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 never. In fact, I don't pray in a group for people to receive this. In fact, I will confide in you that I don't particularly enjoy charismatic groups. That's why I don't go to them. I don't consider myself a member of the... I've prayed for ever so many people to receive, but only in private, one person to one person. Now, this may be only my own fanciful notion. I do not condemn them. I think they're fine. I think they're great. They do, they do a great work. But I myself don't particularly enjoy them. I think I have an uncomfortable feeling that people tend to get the gift of tongues and get a little bit too excited about it and think, here it is, they think they've arrived when they haven't arrived. So, some of you have already received this, and I am thrilled as I go around to find more and more that people have received the power of the Holy Spirit up to a point. But I am a little bit disturbed about some things. Thinking, the main thing being, thinking that charismatic means that you speak with tongues. It doesn't at all. That's only one of the gifts of the Spirit. Assuming, that is, that you've arrived when you haven't arrived. You've taken one step, but you haven't got there yet, you know. Which I rejoice in. If you've gotten everything there is, well, where is it to go from here, you see? Except to heaven, but we're not all allowed to go just this minute. So, so I rejoice in this. You know, I even know people who, having once received the gift of tongues, thereafter, assuming that they have all the gifts, God forgive us, will in a charismatic group, you know, say to somebody, oh, I discern the devil in you, let me cast him out. Look, my friends, don't you ever do that. You are probably mistaken, you're probably transferring. Where is the devil? <laughs> you have no right to go up to anyone and say that you discern the devil in them. You should not be that conscious of the devil. You should be conscious of Jesus, and you should discern Jesus in them. Now, I mean this. I really and truly mean this. And terrible harm can be done. How do I know? Because when somebody gets all upset by this, who do they come to? They run to Mama. Sure. I, I know. I'm not making things up. There are times for use of the prayer of exorcism, and those are the times when Jesus used it. Search the scriptures and you will see. When a man was lame, he did not cast out of him a devil of lameness. He simply cured him and said, arise and walk. 
The only time he cast out the devil was when the person was mentally disturbed. Search the scriptures and see. But don't be too worried about this, because after all, there is the thing that's the most important that you can do, and this you can do with complete and utter and absolute safety, praise the Lord. That is, you can pray for the person to be filled with the perfect love of Jesus. A young man came to me not long ago, and I really, I thought to myself, I really believe this young chap he had changed so suddenly, and he happened to be in one of the earthquakes that was worse than, uh, you know, usual, and it upset him and so forth. And I thought, now, it is possible that some mm, spirit of fear got into him. But I wasn't going to use the word. I said to him this. I said, look, I'm just going to pray. He was 19. He understood perfectly. I said, I'm just going to pray now for the perfect love of Jesus to come into you. Now, I said, perfect love casts out fear. You find that in the Bible. So as I pray for the perfect love of Jesus to come into you, these funny little frightened notions you've got, you see, they will just go away. They'll just go. So I prayed for the perfect love of Jesus to come into him. And in my own mind, but not out loud, I did say, now, perfect love casts out fear, so look if there's any little devil of fear in here that doesn't belong. Out! <laughs> but I didn't say that out loud. No need of frightening people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your perfect love casts out fear. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How could you care enough about us, think enough of us, so that you would actually share with us your Holy Spirit from the heavens. Thank you, Lord Jesus, you have done so. And whether or not we have received all that we can receive, there is no question that all of us here have received some of this holy life from the heavens. And I pray that you will abide in us more and more, so that either step by step, gradually, so that we hardly know from day to day when it happens, or perhaps at some future time with the prayers of, of one or two people, whatever way you feel best, O oh Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit may complete in every one of us your glorious work of redemption and freeing and sanctification some of us think that's an old-fashioned word, but it's still a true word. The Holy Spirit abiding in us and making us holy with the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>